Welcome back, everybody, to the last week of October, and it is my distinct honor and a privilege to welcome somebody who you have known. I'm sure you've recognized him already. Those of you who would not recognize the face will definitely recognize the voice, because for the last <laughs> uh, number of decades, we've seen and heard Mr. Stacy Keach everywhere. Please welcome to the program, Mr. Stacy Keach. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. No, it's, it's my pleasure, sir. When, when I started this program um, a little bit over five months ago, it's, uh, this, we're, we're, it, we're just a few days into our six months of existence. Uh, these are the type of conversations that I was yearning to have. So I'm, I'm grateful that you said yes. Oh, my pleasure. And um, um, I'm, I'm in Chicago uh, at the moment, outside of uh, Chicago, you know, uh, at my home. My kids are doing their schooling uh, a few doors from me. My wife is downstairs having her meetings. <laughs> Where does COVID time find you? It finds me at my home in Magdalenka, Poland. It's oh. a suburb. It's about 45 minutes outside of Warsaw. And uh, my wife is Polish, Malgosia. And we've been, uh, well, this is our 34th year of marriage. And we've been living in Poland and the United States for the last 30 years. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, I have not been to Poland, but living in Chicago, which is the, uh, the second largest uh, Polish community outside of Warsaw, I, I yeah. certainly am familiar uh, to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, you speak English? I don't, but I'm originally don't from- Don't know why. <laughs> Except uh, for a few words. Well, I'm originally from Ukraine. So uh, Ukrainian is, um, you know, I, I, maybe I'm incorrect, but from my understanding, you know, Ukrainian and Polish have the same base. So uh, when <laughs> my, yeah, when my Polish friends speak, I, I can understand uh, quite a bit. When I read, I can understand a lot more. So uh -huh. um, yeah, it's, it's, it's somewhere in there just because of the familiarity. Right. Yeah. And uh, you, you speak Polish after, after uh, living there for a while? You know, I don't really speak Polish. I understand a lot. Both of my kids grew up speaking Polish and English. So whenever they want something from dad, they speak Polish behind my back. So <laughs> I have to understand more than I can speak. I, I, I do understand quite a bit of it, but uh, it's a difficult language. I've tried so hard to become, you know, bilingual. Mm -hmm. and it's very difficult. The spelling of the, of the words, you know, just all these consonants, you know, together, it's, it's, it's hard. I, I, <laughs> I find it a little bit ironic from, uh, from an actor who spent uh, many years uh, working and doing Shakespeare. So if you're having yeah. uh, troubles with Polish, I, <laughs> I, I think others may as well. Um, so the name of my program and uh, the reason for this program is my love of acting. Now, uh, where does yours come from? It started with my family, really. My dad, God love him, was an actor. And my mom studied acting, even though she never went into it professionally. But I was, uh, I grew up in a theatrical family. And um, I started acting when I was, I guess, four years old. I, I, I played Old King Cole in the school pageant in Taft, Texas. Yeah, I'll never forget that. I, mean, I still remember when I cut to him, it was this weird cape and this weird crown. It didn't fit, and I was always trying to get the crown to fit on my head. Anyway, that was my beginning. That was the beginning of it. But my, my parents did not want me to become an actor. They really, having been in the business, they, they thought it was it's an insecure profession. It's fraught with heart heartache and and uh, do something you know like become a lawyer or a doctor do something that you know you can make a steady living, but I didn't want to do it. So when I was about twelve, I started acting in school plays more more religiously in high, junior high school and high school, and. Uh, I, I, I love acting. I mean, it's, uh, it's something I, I uh, people often ask me, because I direct as well, and, and I write, what do you prefer? And I prefer, I prefer acting, I really do. I, 
Yeah. What right. is it? Uh, sorry for interrupting. Go ahead, sir. No. Yeah. What is it about acting that um, grabs you and that uh, allows you to have that preference as opposed to you know writing music as I know you do or directing? I think it's 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 coming to to understand or to know or to explore the behavior of another person mm -hmm. and to then express your version of that behavior and that's kind of i mean i'm i'm people fascinate me and and um i've always been drawn to eccentricity in a way i think we all are you know uh, not so much in the current uh, eccentric uh, man in the white no yeah uh, i draw a line but but i i think that people have their their dreams and their fears and as an actor, I like to explore those aspects of another person's character. Now, when I'm playing a fictitious character, as in, um, well, uh, uh, maybe in a, playing a, a dad in a sitcom or, mm -hmm. or, uh, or a, a, a hero in a, in a movie, it's not necessarily biographical, I then the way I go about approaching the role is is to use abstractions. In other words, I, I like to I say, what, what musical instrument would this person be? Mm -hmm. What color would this be? Would this person be? What um, what? Uh, how does this person walk and look? You know. And as a student of acting, and also as a teacher of it, I, I encourage my kids to go and just, you know, to sit and watch people in, and try to create in your mind an instant biography for that person. That's wonderful. Um, I, I've used uh, certain aspects of it because when I, would read uh, a uh, you know read sides or read a script whether it's an audition or or something that I'm doing some things come to mind and just for whatever reason I said okay that person is this animal uh, uh -huh. yeah and uh, it's you know there's all sorts of things that just start you know bubbling up uh, just based on any of these references and then right. you you address it so I'm I'm very very happy that you said that because that validates uh, one of my approaches. Well, I think it's very important because it stimulates the imagination. Mm -hmm. It also it allows you to look in a much less literal way at a person, and I think that um, I think that's important for actors who really want to play different characters, mm -hmm. leading men, you know, in a kind of situation. If you just want to be the same person all the time, that's a form of acting. It's not something that interests me necessarily. I've been down that road where I had to be a leading man when I was young, you know, but I was always, basically, I've always been a character actor, really, you know. I don't, I don't like these categories necessarily, but that's what we have, you know, it's what we have. Um, yeah, and I think that uh, abstraction is a, is a very, it's a good, it's a good way, I think, for young actors to, to, um, Explore. Curiosity is a very another is a really important aspect. I think of being able as a, as an artist, not just as an actor. I think as you know, as a musician or a painter. I mean, or a writer, a poet. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. to have questions about somebody well, because on your journey to express what you want to express, you have to I think allow that to to happen on its own. I mean, that, uh, um, some people think I'm nuts when they, when I, I, I talk about, you know, the different ways of, of like reciting a, a line. I mean, I, I, I told my young actors to 
take I love you, for example, the word, you know, the line I love you, and say it 10 different ways, you know, and find, you know, there is no one way to do anything in this business. Um, I mean, you, except you have to hit the notes. I think, you know, a lot of actors tend to think that if they are experts in improvisations, they can improvise what a, a screenwriter or a playwright has written. And I, I, I draw the line there. A writer has written a, a line, a specific way, and that's what, that's, your job as an actor is to say that line, you know, and express it, those words uh, in your own terms, but not to change the line, not to make it, you know, you don't make, uh, you don't say, I love thee, I love you, you know, uh, um, or the, changing a this for that. Sometimes I get crazy when I'm doing a movie or something like that. I read a line. I'll go to the to the writer, and if I if I feel uncomfortable saying it, so, uh, you know, I'll ask him, you know, writer, if we could do it a different way or try it two ways. Do it the way it's written, and then maybe express it a, a little bit with, with a, a, a different twist or a different, or even a different word. But to do that, you have to get permission from the writer and the director. Yeah, you know, a lot of actors get in trouble because they go off on their on their own trajectory and just, just say, "Well, that's the way I'm going to do it." <laughs> yes. Um, and about hitting those uh, those particular notes, uh, I I remember you know listening to some of your past interviews that you were very specific as to you know mapping out a whole diagram of your performance down to the particular beat of, you know, uh, you know, brushing your hair with the left hand. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is that one of the ways to, uh, to approach it? Or how do you use that, but still play the organic uh, moments without pre-planning behind it? I think that a lot of what you're talking about in terms of gestures or, or business those things happen in the process. And then after the fact, after you, you know, then you have to, you know, you have to repeat it. In movies, it's very important. It's called matching, as you know. You know, you know if, you, if, you use, if that's what you're doing, you know, you can't do this on the next day. Right. You know, you've got to do the other two there. You know, but that's, those are, those are things that I think, they, they, they're best served when they, they, come out organically when they are, when they emerge as a result of what you're doing in terms of expressing the character in that particular moment mm -hmm. and um, I, I remember reading that in your process you first learn the lines without really kind of discovering the character and then you get to work about discovering the character and then making choices. So first you get the lines down, then you work on the character. I found that interesting. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. I think the text is where you discover, you know, you may have some pre preconceptions are dangerous, you know, because if you get stuck with them and you really, you know, if you have, well, I know exactly how I want to do this. I want to do this, you know, I, generically, well, generally speaking, it's okay in, in, in one respect. I mean, I, for example, with Hamlet, which I've, I've played three times, and, and I always say, you never get it right. Hamlet, you know, you don't play Hamlet, Hamlet plays you. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I always wanted to make sure that well, I did have a preconception there, and that was I wanted the character to be active and humorous. Hmm. I wanted to to accentuate the humor because it it is a tragedy. I mean, it is a tragic story, but by the same token, the madness allows the actor to be free to express the more ironic and humorous side of the of the character. Hmm. Interesting. Um, 
what uh, I, I know that you know uh, many people believe that you are one of the preeminent uh, American actors in uh, in Shakespeare. Um, what drew you to Shakespeare and continues to do so? Oh my gosh, that's a that's a tough one. I mean, uh, the challenge of and the, the scope of Shakespeare's genius really provides us with such memorable characters that um, that will that will tolerate the interpretation of many many different actors and uh, I, I when I was in college I had the great privilege of seeing Olivier perform um, Richard the Third Hamlet and Henry the Fifth uh, all in the same afternoon. And I was at a, at a theater on the north side of Berkeley, California. And it just blew me away. I just said, wow, that's amazing. You know, and I, I had, up to that point, I read Shakespeare, but I didn't, I had never acted or even thought of acting in Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. That's what inspired me then to, to audition for the Oregon Shakespeare Festival when I was a, a sophomore in Berkeley and was accepted. And I went to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival and just completely fell in love with Shakespeare there. That's where it happened for me. Wow. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, I, I was uh, I was saying that's very interesting that that's what inspired you. It was a great performance that inspired you to uh, to want to do the same. And I I remember mm -hmm. you saying that uh, to be a great actor, you have to play great parts. Uh, and I think that maybe is one of the other reasons that you're drawn to Shakespeare, because there are so many great parts in order to uh, to entertain the acting um, experience. Very well said. That is true. Hmm. Um, if, um, because you've played, uh, you know, so many different, uh, uh, Shakespeare plays and you play the characters more than once, if you had to pick one character, um, to play again, which one would it be and why? Oh, to talk about Richard III, I think perhaps would be one of my favorite characters. I, even though I've, I did Hamlet three times and I did, I've done Lear a couple of times as well, um, three, three times. I've never, I've only done Richard III once. Hmm. Uh, but, but uh, and I'm, I'm too old to play him now, but nevertheless, that's, it's such a, it's a wonderful part. Uh, and I identify with the character tremendously because uh, I've been grown up with a, uh, a cleft lip. Mm -hmm. uh, I was teased a lot as a child, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I still remember those events, you know. And that's what, in, in his opening soliloquy, Richard III talks about, you know, about his youth and growing up and the fact that he was deformed and unfinished and sent before his time into this breathing world, scarce half made up. And that's so lamely that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. I mean, that bitterness mm -hmm. just so informs that character. So, you know, and it, it was my favorite. Uh, it was my favorite Richard uh, Olivier's. Richard was absolutely great, magnificent, brilliant. I've seen it like maybe twice. So, I don't know, more than 10 <laughs> times. Yeah. That's, that's the, you know, it's hard to pick one Shakespearean character because there's so, there's so many wonderful, you know, I mean, I, and I never got to play Iago. Mm -hmm. It's a character that I've, I've always wanted to play. I mean, I always, I think it's one of the great villains of, of you know, Villains are more interesting, I think, than heroes in Shakespeare, too. Mm -hmm. The complications, the, the, you know, anyway. Yeah, there's 
more to work with. I, I, I in speaking with actors, I, I hear that uh, quite a bit. That it is definitely more interesting to play the villain because uh, it gives you yeah, yeah. freedom. Yeah, yeah, it's freeing too. It's liberating. Mm -hmm. You don't have to. You know, you you don't have this kind of. You don't have to be in a, in a in a morality box. You can break out of that and just allow yourself to um, express all the devious kind of hidden the subterfuge emotions that uh, you can't express in life otherwise you get arrested <laughs> have um and again you know looking through your careers and see and uh seeing so many credits on imdb it's hard to kind of uh you know pick apart but um, did you have a chance to play uh, a number of villains? Um, you know, what's what's your favorite one? Well, Richard the Third. I mean, that's uh, you know, that's yeah. him. That's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I I love Edmund is a wonderful villain too. In uh, in here, a lot of people think he's not he's not a villain because he redeemed himself at the end. But um, I had the great honor and privilege of playing. That part with Lee J. Cobb was mm. here in Lincoln Center back in my salad days, you know. And I really had a great time doing that. Yeah, it was wonderful. But it's uh, it's a it's a it, it's sort of the baby of Richard III and Iago, Edmund. Um, yeah, that's interesting and. I uh, less the less part on Shakespeare, which which I agree with you on, because again, my personal experience. You mentioned that uh, you would love for Shakespeare to to have some updated feel to it, to introduce it to a newer audience. Uh, mm. I I recall in uh, in two thousand, uh, actually, I think I have the date uh, on uh, February twenty first, two thousand. I was uh, I think freshman or sophomore in college. And we went to the Chicago Shakespeare uh, um, Theater and we saw Midsummer Night's Dream. And the way that they did it was, uh, it was a modern approach to it. And uh, I, I remember being blown away. I wrote a whole, you know, my own kind of uh, poem about it uh, after the fact, which I'm happy to read to you after, you know, we're done taping. But that was what really kind of drew me to Shakespeare because I wasn't really fascinated with it before but yeah. having had that experience it, it uh, uh, started the fire uh, if you will so I, I i was happy to hear you say that even though you're a traditionalist you want some things to be updated so the new audience uh, really gets to appreciate it i did that when we, we did king lear in chicago at the goodman theater mm -hmm. it, it was uh, to test him. it was a modern version of Lear, mm -hmm. directed brilliantly by Robert Falls. And I resisted it at the beginning. I really, I thought, you know, I'd always sort of imagined my Lear when I came to it as being Stonehenge on a revolve, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, and with lots of fur and, uh, no, it, it, it's much more interesting, I think, when you can find the modern, equivalent of, of, of in Shakespeare. Hmm. Not all of Shakespeare lends itself. I don't want to see another Western taming of the shrew. <laughs> I, I just don't want to see it. But I, I, I wouldn't mind seeing uh, an updated version of Othello mm -hmm. uh, with a more of a Moorish Muslim versus Christian dynamic. Uh, I would also love to see a more uh, Julius Caesar lends itself, and God knows Orson Welles, you know, gave gave Shakespeare a modern thrust in his wonderful career. Mm -hmm. uh, not only with with that play, but with uh, a few others as well. Um, but Caesar, I think, really lends itself to the dictator of the day. You know, I mean, uh, I'm sure there'll be some Caesars that have blonde hair that looks like Donald Trump. 
you know. Could be, could I'm be. Sure. Yeah. I'm sure. One of the things that I, my career began doing a satire of Shakespeare, a play hmm. called Beck Bird, which was written by Barbara Garson. We did it in the 60s at the Village Gate, and it suggested that Lyndon Johnson was responsible for the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Oh my goodness. <laughs> And it was a satire. It was, it was the Scottish play, but it had thrown in lines from other Shakespeare. But it was basically, uh, yeah. That's very interesting. Um, yeah, there are all, all sorts of questions that I would love to ask, but I don't want to go there in terms of how it was received and uh, how people... I thought we were going to get blown. I thought it was going to be, you know, we accused all of us of sedition and we're going to get, you know, going to shut us down. No, it didn't, it didn't happen. Yeah. It's, satire is an interesting, uh, is an interesting genre. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have great respect for Mel Brooks and, and what he's yeah. done. Uh, and I remember, uh, I'm Jewish, um, uh, and I remember some of my friends uh, stopped uh, watching uh, Mel Brooks after the producers because they were just aghast at, uh, at some of the references that he was making. And I don't have a problem with it. Uh, I, I can appreciate the uh, satire and humor, but it's, it's, it's a tough needle to thread. It is. It is indeed. But I think the bottom line is, is it funny? Right. Yeah. If it's funny, give it to me, you know? And I mean, springtime for Hitler is just, it's classic. It's, it's great. I, it is. It's fantastic. I love it. Uh, I love it. Yeah, I, I still think in, in terms of musicals, for me personally, um, producers is, is either my one or two. It, it's hard for me to pick. It's, it's still one. It's still there. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of actors that you have worked with, because that's an encyclopedia uh, on its own. And, you know, watching, watching your reel, um, you know, you get to see pretty much every great actor that I have seen over the last you know, 20, 30 years. Um, I know who inspired you, but out of the actors that you had a chance to work with, are there any that stand out that you could say based on the pure acting chops that you would say that's, that's a great actor? I just had the great privilege of working with that person, oh. Alfred Molina. Alfred Molina, yes, yeah. We just did, in fact, it's available, to, you can see it now. It's on, uh, it's, um, we just did Home, David Story's Home. We just zoomed it. It's, it's, it's available. You can, it, it, uh, it's I, so sorry for interrupting. I was going to ask where is it available because I want to link it right below the video so people can watch it. StacyKeatsZoomTheater.com Got it. Um, Alfred Molina is a great, great actor. I, I read, the first time I saw him, he was in art on Broadway. Hmm. And played Ivan. The play that I actually, I did, I was, one, I was one of the first Americans to do that in London. But I was just blown away by his performance. And then I saw him do Red, of course, which he played where he was just amazing. And more recently, at the Fascinating Playoffs, he did uh, The Father, brilliant. So I just, it was my great honor and privilege to work with him. Wow. And I'm looking, I hope to get to do more with him. He's off to do his Spider-Man right now. So. I, he was, he's fantastic. I, he's so versatile. Um, you know, seeing him just uh, do characters who have enormous strengths and you, you feel that uh, emanate throughout. And then being a character who is very weak and very timid and just to see that range uh, within Alfred was, was fantastic. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you. I, 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 that's, that's definitely a name that, that comes to mind out of the great actors that I've watched over the past uh, number of years. Um, I know your your parents initially did not want you, <clears throat> excuse me, to be in this business because of the way it is. And I know you mentioned that 
uh, your career. You know, there were there were times when you were worried about the phone ringing and thinking maybe you should become a lawyer. Um, <laughs> how how did you navigate those ebbs and flows of a career as again successful as yours, but you had the moments as well? I think yes. Most actors do have, whether they're big stars or not. I mean, they, they, they go through periods of, even if it's, if they're not worried about finances and putting food on the table, if that's, you know, that's a real issue that young actors today have to deal with. And we're ticking now with the coronavirus. It's, mm -hmm. it's tough. It's tough. I, I pride myself on the fact that I, I, I could do voiceovers mm -hmm. as a means of sustaining my livelihood while I was waiting for the next part to come along. And that's really kind of, and, and the live theater, the live theater. I think those are the two th things that if you don't, if you know, if, you, if the phone isn't ringing, you know, you're not being asked to star in, in a movie or a television series. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that I, you know, sustain me. And, and now, during this coronavirus, uh, I'm, I've, we've, since April, I've zoomed, I zoomed King Lear, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Huey, the Unexpected Man, um, David Story's Home, and The Best Man, recently with Morgan Freeman and John Malkovich. I just did a cameo of one scene that I was proud to have been in. You know, we're Zooming now. This is what we're doing. This is what I... And speaking of Zoom, um... And you know, all of us have to do Zoom auditions, or we have to, uh, we you know, and some films are shot in that way now. Um, right. In terms of the connection, because uh, when you uh, when you are working with another uh, uh, actor in a scene, it is yeah. really about the eyes. It's it's about their body. It's about you being affected by them. When you're right. doing this through Zoom, and it's hard to know where to look because you really shouldn't be looking directly at the camera. You're the person is really kind of beneath or to your left or to your right. Where have you found a better way of connecting via Zoom? There is a technique. Okay. There is a Zoom technique that I'm just discovering and I'm just learning about. Mm -hmm. But if, I care, if the character is talking is to my left, mm -hmm. I listen to the left, and then I talk to the character this way. Mm -hmm. You acknowledge the character where the character is, but you talk to the character there. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I, I will be uh, definitely trying to <laughs> use that <laughs> in the future. <laughs> going, going back through your career and um, living in the spotlight, because you again, have had um, a lot of accolades and you were the leading man and you've done comedy and you've done uh, theater. And being in the spotlight, I know at a certain point in your, in your career that was not easy and, you know, in 1984, um, um, you know, we, we know what, what occurred. Um, how, if you, had to, uh, if you had to give advice to the uh, actors in the spotlight now, what would you suggest for them to do in order to uh, enjoy the benefits without really going down the rabbit hole of the negativity that can come with it? Well, it's a tough question to answer, but I think um, fame is fleeting. And the true measurement, I think, of success personal success, personal gratification comes with immersing yourself in your work, in your art. If a person is an, in this business strictly to make money or to be famous, then 
the pitfalls that will very likely come are very difficult for that, I think, person to, to remedy the pain and the anguish of or the feeling of rejection and deprivation, or whatever. Uh, I think immersing yourself in what you love. And for me, it's, it's uh, plays, also music, but plays, plays. I love plays. And uh, I'm now in the process of translating the seagull hmm. by taking six different versions of it and choosing my own. Because I want to do this, I want to zoom this down the road. But that, you know, when I get, when I just go, you know, I, I just take three different versions of the seagull and uh, that's what I'm working on right now. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, there is, uh, when actors work uh, in a scene with, uh, with somebody who is a master of their craft, there can be an intimidation factor. And most of the actors that I have spoken with on the program have had to experience uh, a bit of that and some butterflies working with <clears throat> in a scene with somebody who they admire and somebody who is incredible at what they do. <clears throat> Most of the actors who have been in scenes with you would feel that way. So from your perspective of somebody who's been doing this for uh, uh, quite a while and who is as accomplished at it, what have you found of how to keep uh, the other actor, uh, how to keep their confidence up or how to work with them in order to bring the best out of them, knowing that they may be intimidated working with you. I think the best way to do that is to allow that person to experience whatever we're doing together more than once, mm -hmm. repeat it. In other words, if somebody's intimidated, well, that was good, but let's try it again, do it again. And then do it again and find out the different ways of doing something. And somebody, so, you know, a person by virtue of that repetition will find a level of confidence or gratification that, you know, but you can't just, it's by doing it more than once. Do it a few times. And you'll find that most, most people, if they're insecure, that will, that will allow them to feel more secure because they've now they've experienced the different boundaries of something. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, what would you, again, being on so many sets, if you had to pick a few uh, important pieces of uh, advice about being on a set and how not to behave on a set, but you know, the, the kind of rules of the road of these are the important things as you're on set, what would be? Treat everybody with equal respect, mm -hmm. whether they're the caterer or the cameraman. I think that's important. Everybody has their job that they're doing. Nobody is less important than anybody else on a movie. Everybody is working together. I think that's, you know, yeah, I think that, that's, that's my advice to yeah. young actors. Yeah. Thank you. And, um, you know, going through that advice, um, what else would you recommend to young actors or not so young actors who are trying to make it in this business? Um, what would be some of the advices that you would give to them? Well, you have to be able to to understand. You have to be able to withstand rejection in a way that's almost superhuman. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, disappointments happen all the time in this business, and being able to let it, you know, water off a duck's back, you know, all these cliches exists for a reason, but it doesn't mean that you can't be just depressed and disappointed. It doesn't mean you should give up. 
it means perhaps that you should go on and do something differently. But being able to withstand rejection is a tough, tough thing for any human being. And we actors and musicians as well mm -hmm. are, um, have to have, you know, have to be, have to have thick skin. And maybe, you know, maybe some people discover that they're just not made for it. That it's not something they want to do. They don't want to go through, you know, they don't want to go through the pain and anguish of, of in the, the depression of constantly of not getting the part. Well, my sweet, wonderful daughter, uh, Carolina, mm -hmm. is an actress, and when she's gone through, and I, I witnessed, you know, being rejected, getting turned, getting very close, and then it just didn't happen. Yeah. And that's part of the baggage that we have to carry with us wherever we go. And uh, there's no, there's no easy answer to that. You know, there really isn't. I mean, we all deal with rejection in in our own in our own way. Uh, I think I deal with it probably. In, the best way that I can deal with it is by diverting my attention to something outside of that realm. You know, I've lost some wonderful parts in my career that I came very close to, and. My salvation was that I could go to the theater and do a play. Mm -hmm. And that, that really, for me, was you know, the way around getting you know, suicidal. Um, what I found uh, as, as I was starting out, because I've heard that acting is all about rejection, but I, I came from sales. Uh, so sales, uh -huh. You know, dealing with rejection and cold calling and that was not new to me what I realized the more difficult part for me in acting was not hearing anything because a rejection has a finality to it and you you complete the cycle when you're not hearing anything that was much worse because you keep wondering if at some point you're going to receive the call and you never do and that seems to be the majority of the times you audition and then you hear nothing. That's true. You don't hear anything, yeah. 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 I've often, th the auditioning process is a fascinating process. I, it's barbaric. But I, I've told young actors, I said, the, the way, the, the psychological adjustment when you go into an audition, first of all, you've got to be prepared. You've got to know what it is, you've got to, if, you've got, if they give you the signs the night before, you, you, you go over them a million times. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you can do it this way, that way, you can do it 50 different ways, you know, whatever they want. But that when you're coming into the audition, you are auditioning them. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that you're not sure that you want to do, you, you want to be in there movie, their television show, whatever, you know, you're not sure. So you're auditioning them. And it gives you a feeling, it, it, it lifts you out of the vic, being the victim. Mm -hmm. yeah, you've got to be, you know, it's, it's a adjustment. It's, uh, you know. Yeah. Is there um, a quote that you live by or a quote that stays with you? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I know you are a composer as well, and you've mentioned music, and that's not something that many people know about you. Is right. there other thing that you're willing to share of something that you do that people really don't know about you? I think music is, it covers that pretty much. Yeah, yeah no. Um, I'm a terrible golfer. I love, <laughs> uh, I love to play. Um, music, no, I, and I'm, I'm planning, 
in my twilight years to uh, share my music with people more, much more so than I have in the past. That's great. That's, that's down the road, yeah, down the road. So there's no uh, place where we can hear it now. Uh, we'll need to stay tuned, right? Uh, I could play something for you right now if you want to hear it. Please, I would love to. Thank you. You know, well, I've got my, uh, or uh, something I just recorded. Um, Hold on, let me see if I can. Mm -hmm. um, I can get my machine. Let's see. Okay. original obviously it's Harlem Nocturne but it was my camera It's not an easy uh, piece to play. Are you, do you, are you a musician? I, I am a uh, aficionado. I, I am not a musician. Uh -huh. I, I love, um, you know, piano is, is uh, the piano and violin are my two favorite instruments. And uh, uh -huh. my uncle was a musician. So uh -huh. I, I grew up around music and um, as a part of the, you know, the Russian education system. Uh, right. we, Classical music was, was kind of a part of all of the curriculum from the beginning. Uh, I remember being introduced to classical music in kindergarten. So um, I, I have a deep appreciation for music. And that's, I was actually going to ask you that question. So for me, when, um, when I get to, ask, uh, to play dramatic parts, and you actually referenced that too, that uh, you, you played a lot more drama than comedy and you love comedy which I do as well. Um, uh -huh. When I get really deep into a, a particular character, my way home uh, of getting back to myself is music, uh, is musicals. It's music. It, it's, it's a different energy. It's a different vibration. And it reminds me of who I am. So what, um, what is your way? What, when you had to kind of really go deep into somebody who is unlike yourself, how did you come back? What was your path? Well, I, I don't. I don't make. This, I don't separate necessarily. I mean, mm. um, it's like being a doctor in a way. It's like it's, you, you're, you, you you take a person, <laughs> a surgeon, really. Yeah. You take a person apart, to, you know, and then you put them back together. But I, I never lose myself in that process. Mm -hmm. I myself, I, I, I allow myself to, to to dive into that person's personality, mm -hmm. but um, 
That's not, it wasn't always true. When I was a young actor, I'll never forget, I, I was, I was my first Hamlet, the first time I played Hamlet, mm. and I was living with a young lady, and I remember coming home and practicing my role by screaming and yelling, you know, get thee to a nun, and this girl that I was living with, it was not good. It was very, <laughs> in other words, I, I was at, I was out of control. Mm -hmm. The character was overwhelming me to the point of, um, I lost myself. But that was for a very short period of time. I suddenly, I realized that, you know, when you, when you go home at night or when you leave the set or you leave the theater, you get, you know, you hang the character up on a hook and, mm -hmm. and it becomes just part of your process or, Using the analogy of a of a surgeon, you know, you you, you, you know, you take your hands, scrub, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. put your tools away, and you go home. Yeah. yeah. How would you like to be remembered? Oh. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think vers versatility is my. You know, being, being versatile. Somebody who's versatile could do different things. Because I, I prided myself in that respect, and I worked very hard to be able to do that. To be, to be able to do comedy and drama, and modern and classical, and also uh, uh, to do. Um, different voices, you know, mm -hmm. exploring all the different ways of doing something. And I think, again, I tell young actors, read aloud, read aloud, read aloud in a, as a Southern cracker, read aloud as a New York Jew, read aloud as a, uh, uh, as a woman, read aloud as a, you know, and, and read the same thing over in, in many different ways. I think repetition, again, I keep coming back to that because I've, I've discovered that it's, it's really the essence of being able of discovery. To go to, to do something more than once, many times, and you will discover different ways of doing something. That's wonderful. Um, it's uh, I, I'm, I'm a loss for words. It's, it's a really, truly a privilege to speak with you. And uh, thank you so much for thank you, thank you for your questions and uh, good, good luck and check out home. Yes. Check out, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll find it. It'll be right below the video. So everybody who's watching, please uh, go view it. And um, thanks to everybody for tuning in into another um exciting episode of the love of acting we know you love it as much as we do and that's why we really really appreciate it <laughs>